73% of Canadians think home ownership is only for the rich, with 66% of non-homeowners giving up on the dream. You mentioned the number 66%. That's also the average monthly amount people spend on their mortgage right now. Okay, well, two thirds of your money is going to your mortgage. The other third is going to the government for taxes. Then you also factor in the 32% of soft costs on the actual building of the house goes to the government again for permits and other red tape and all that kind of stuff. This is why you have to point to the guy that's at the top and he's been there for eight, nine years almost now and everything under this guy's rule has gotten substantially worse. A pair of American law professors are alleging that some stock traders had advanced knowledge of the Hamas attacks in Israel on October 7th and used that information to make millions of dollars by short selling Israeli stocks. The numbers were interesting. This was in like the 99th percentile in terms of volume of how much this stock has been shorted over the last 15 years. It's even the plot of Casino Royale. The Schiff takes a bunch of money from different warlords, promising them a crazy return on investment, shorts a airline, and then tries to carry out a terrorist attack against that airline in order to profit off of shorting their stocks. Of course. And then obviously Bond stopped it. But we don't have a real life Bond. To your point, we're talking about Bond villains. Yeah. These are the kind of slimy scum fucks that do this stuff. Hey everybody, welcome to the Blender Report, where news meets rational thinking. I'm your host, Jonathan Harvey, and this is your co-host, Liam DeBoer. Liam, how are you doing today? Fantastic, pal. Things are good. Good. Life is good. I'm a little tired, so you're going to do the heavy lifting today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm prepared. All right. Well, uh, first off here, in the realm of political advertising, conservative leader Pierre Polyev has taken an unconventional approach. Instead of the typical short slogan driven ads, Polyev released a 15 minute video resembling a PBS frontline documentary on Saturday morning titled A Generation Locked Out, The Trudeau Housing Crisis. The IPSOS found that 73% of Canadians think home ownership is only for the rich, with 66% of non home homeowners giving up on the dream. So the documentary kind of broke down into three different aspects, which was the problem, the why, and the solution. So why don't we start off with the problem? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that should surprise everyone is that Canada is sitting on the largest housing bubble in the world, which is pretty wild. Like, you know, when you kind of look at how much land we have and how our supply and demand should work based on how many people we have, it doesn't quite add up, which means this is this has basically all been a symptom of bad policy, right? And you mentioned the number 66%. That's also the amount that the average that's also the average monthly amount people spend on their mortgage right now. So this number, I believe, 20 years ago was about 40%. The problem is when you look at that, you go, okay, well, two-thirds of your money is going to your mortgage. The other third is going to the government for taxes. So effectively, you have no money to spend on clothing or food or anything else. And Canada has to continue digging deeper into consumer debt, which is one of our biggest problems already. So for me, I mean, you look at kind of how, how this is affecting the everyday Canadian. And I think, I think that's a pretty alarming statistic. You know, I think it's a, a really good way to paint the picture in sort of one viewpoint. And the other thing, too, um, that kind of surprised me when I was watching this is they made some comparisons to other big cities. You know, they compared us to London, Paris, New York, and Singapore. And what was interesting is these places all have more money, more people, and less land. Yet they're all less expensive than homes in Canada. And, you know, it just kind of highlights, again, sort of bad policy being put into place. And a lot of this has been over the last eight to 10 years because of Trudeau. Like, I, I, wish, that, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish there was someone else to point the finger at because... Honestly, sometimes I feel like I'm beating a dead horse or I just really hate the guy so much. People are like, hey, can you blame someone else for anything? And I would really like to, but, you know, for this, who else do you, who else could you possibly point the finger at? Yeah, when you, when you look at the trajectory of everything, not even just housing alone, but every single metric has just gotten worse. We have the most amount of land per person out of any G7 nation by a long shot, too. Huge margin. And we also have the fewest houses per capita yeah. in the G7. It's just those two things do not add up. Although I could see one way where that statistic gets unfairly represented because there is a lot of Canadian land which isn't necessarily... Habitable, sure. But even if you call it half, let's say it's half, right? 
the thing is, if you looked at the multiple on the next closest G7 nation, it was like 6x in terms of per capita. So we're not even close. Yeah. So it's, it's an excuse, but not a really good one. One of the things that actually was pretty alarming to me was that we built the same number of homes in 1972 as we did in 2022. Actually, we built less, a little less. I think it was 230,000 homes in 72 with a population of around 19 to 20 million. And then in 2022, when the population was twice the size, we built 220 some odd thousand homes. So that, that, that in and of itself, that statistic just shows you they were just, he's been unable to build critical infrastructure and the means to, to advance and develop our critical infrastructure at the same pace that they're driving immigration to drive GDP. So when you kind of look at that, you're like, hey, like, there's no, there is no good excuse. No matter what angle you take, this has been an absolute debacle. Yeah, and to even adding on to that statistic you were talking about where 66% of the average salary goes towards the average mortgage. And then you also factor in the 32% of soft costs on the actual building of the house goes to, to the government again for permits and other red tape and exactly. all that kind of stuff. So they're, they're profiting on both ends, which is absolutely insane. That's one of the things I find is they continually manipulate situations to try to bookend their gains. And then it just puts people in a more precarious situation. Like you'd rather just go to it, like, let's simplify this and stop adding in like, you know, we'll talk about quantitative easing in a moment, but you stop adding in all these complex things and just be straight with people. Because like you said, they're, they're adding more people to the government while increasing all of these other things that are making the price of homes go up. So you're paying more in taxes to afford the government. And then you're paying more for the home because of their inability to drive supply with demand. And this is all on the government. So again, they're squeezing you on both ends. This is why, you know, again, you have to point to the guy that's at the top. And he's been there for eight, nine years almost now. And everything under this guy's rule has gotten substantially worse. But what concerns me, one, he he's constantly telling us how good a job he's doing. The rhetoric this guy talks is just bananas because it's like everything he says, basically, your, your primary filter with Trudeau should be literally the exact opposite. Listen to what he says and then go look into it because it's the it's 100% false. It's that, almost like his training is in reading scripts. Yeah, you, you, something like that, eh? Um the other thing that bothers me is I don't see them look, you can have a problem. We all have problems, we all create our own problems. But they're not actually implementing any reasonable solutions and there's nothing there's nothing down the line that they've got set up that is going to fix this either. And that's again maybe an even bigger problem than the problem we have today. Well, to your point, the CMHC predicts a 32% plunge in home building this year and is expecting us to be 3.5 million homes short by 2030. There's not even a real talk of any real solution being put in place here, let alone the, the current trajectory of just everything getting astronomically worse in that regards. When you talk about um, needing 3.5 million homes by 2030, and you're building around 200,000 a year. I mean, do the math. Yeah. We're not even going to get halfway there, you know, by 2030. And that's that's also forecasting what's going to happen with immigration and all these other things. It's like there is no system in place. Um, and again, we can kind of move into the why here. And a lot of the reasons why are just because of inefficient systems, but from like integrated into the system at all levels of government, whether it's federal, provincial, or municipal, it's all a mess. Polyev broke it down in that documentary, the problem into essentially two different areas, which is the principal costs of housing, so your actual mortgage, and then um, the interest rate. Yes, right. So why don't we break down both of those those whys? A simple way of trying to understand the interest side of it is, in a big way, has just been government spending. Trudeau printed four to $600 billion in I actually focus on quantitative easing. This is something that I've I've understood a bit about in the past, and I dug in a little more this week. And it's basically just a government's way of, it's a loophole. It's a way for them to get around doing something illegal, essentially. So how the government works is, you know, they sell bonds to people that are willing to buy them to sort of fund the country at a, whatever their rate of return is going to be, whether it's fixed or variable. Right now, it's pretty high. It's around 5%. So it's actually a, a reasonable purchase. And then what the government does is they use that money for spending. Now, when people no longer want to invest in the government or in Canada and they, they can't sell any more bonds well, and you need money, well, then what happens is the government has to print money. Now, the government doesn't just show up with a Brinks truck to Trudeau's house. It fucking feels like that sometimes, though. They do something called quantitative easing. And 
this is some of the most crooked shit I've ever seen. Like I act, I actually threw a hissy fit the other day. <laughs> I was a little tired, but I got really upset about it. So quantitative easing is where they basically, the government goes to the financial institutions with these bonds. They sell them directly to the bank at a set percentage. And then the Bank of Canada turns around and buys them immediately for an increased percentage. So that money they printed then goes to the banks. But then, and the government obviously got the money from the bank to begin with. So what happens is you're basically selling these bonds and then you're giving a massive percent, a, a massive amount of money for free for doing nothing to all these financial institutions just so you can funnel Bank of Canada money back in so the government has more money to play with. So you massively increase the government spending. But this is where all the real problems start, right? So when you do this, the banks now have, they're flush with cash. So what they do is they start handing out low interest loans and they do it to people that are kind of at the front of the line, the people that are preferred customers, let's call it, the wealthy is what it is, right? So once they introduced this quantitative easing, the number of people that were purchasing homes as investments skyrocketed within a year. It went up, I think it doubled. I think it went up over 100%. So when you look at what that creates then, now you've got a supply and demand issue with homes. It's driving the price of homes up. So what that does is it created inflation in the homes. So now what does the bank have to do? Well, now the bank's got to raise interest rates to quell inflation. So that's like a, a very simplified version of what quantitative easing has kind of done to the country. And this is what happens, the symptom of the government saying, we need to print money. I think what it was is the, the increase spend from the government, or maybe just the increased amount of money supply, yes. It was the increased money supply was eight times higher than our GDP over that term. And that's what created this entire mess, especially in terms of, back to that point, where the interest rate increase came from, because you have to now quell inflation because of the quantitative easing problem. Whether it be a journalist or an economicist or whether it be a politician, anybody who has ever said you can do that without major consequences is lying through their teeth. And they yeah. know it too. I <laughs> yeah. don't even, like, it's so basic. It's, it's two plus two equals four type math. I tend to try to adhere to the philosophy of when something goes wrong, chalk it up to incompetence before malice. But this is just, th this level of incompetence would have to be so high to for it to be under that where I have to go, okay, like I don't see any reality where it's not malice. Well, I think a good thing to consider when you look at the people that run these institutions is, remember when Bernanke was running the Federal Reserve down in the US? He got perfect on his SATs, perfect. Those are the types of people that are doing this. They're yeah. not fucking idiots. Yeah. They are far more intelligent than you and I. So they know exactly what they're doing. The idiots are Trudeau and these other guys that are kind of helping them make this come to life because I don't think he's the one making these decisions. But the guys behind this, they know exactly what they're doing. They spent their entire life studying economics. Like, whoops, didn't catch that one. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Didn't. Literally economics you know exactly 101. What you were doing. Yeah, it's like, it's 100% malice, but it's unfortunate. I see it the same way. Especially in politics, I tend to lend to incompetence over malice. But when I see things happening in the economic system from people that are making hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and they know they got perfect on their SATs, I'm going, you fuckers, you know you did this on purpose. You know, like one of the things that actually is continuing to make this worse, though, and this is what I want to highlight about Trudeau, is the government's continuing their spending. So they were the problem to begin with. They're the ones that drove inflation. They're the ones that pushed this quantitative easing problem. They're the ones that made the country uninvestable. People don't want to be a part of it. And now they have to give so much an in interest. Like, I don't even know. That's a, that's a huge problem for down the road. But the thing is, they're just continuing to spend more and more money. Paulie, I've pointed out about $69 billion, but that number is way higher. His, not, his spending in 2022 was 100 million over, 100 billion rather, over his 2018 projection of 2022. And the number just keeps climbing and climbing. And now they're like, well, we might balance the budget eventually. It was 2028. Now I think it's into the 2030s. If they keep spending money, it's like putting one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. And this problem won't get resolved. Well, that $69 billion in, in new spending that he was talking about came right after Freeland said that she was not going to pour, quote unquote, fiscal fuel on the inflation oh, yeah. fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when you take into factor, you know, going back to that original statistic, about 32% of uh, housing costs can be chalked up to red tape and yeah. uh, permits and all of this kind of stuff. 
there was the the one statistic in there that I found very striking was how the government developing charges in Ontario can be as much as a hundred and thirty five thousand dollars per home. That would that one shocked you? You know what got me? That you could pay another hundred and sixty five thousand dollars for parking. Yeah. yeah. Whoa, bro. To par- come on. In the restaurant business, I've dealt with a lot of parking uh, payments in lieu. Parking. I just call it. It's a pill. It's called the pill. So. I remember when I was starting Bonsai, they're like, well, you need 23 spots. That'll be 230 grand. I'm like, well, where are you guys putting the spots? Oh, we don't, we don't actually create the spots. We just, you just have to give us money because you want to park. So wait, I give you money for infrastructure, but it doesn't go to infrastructure. You just take it. It's just a tax. Well, yeah. Well, how about fuck yourself? Wait, explain that to me. Who gets, who gets that? So if you want to build, so if you want to change the use of a property, so we had a property for Bonsai. It was two units that we molded into one to make one bigger restaurant because it wasn't a restaurant before. Now there is the, there are these, these benchmark numbers that exist depending on the business you want. So if you have a takeout restaurant, you need X number of parking spots per square footage that you can, it's a, your, your GFA, your gross floor area. So they do this math base basically to go, well, if you have a capacity of hundred, you should have to have this many parking spots. Then they back into how many come with the property. Obviously, in high traffic areas where you have restaurants, not a lot come with it. So it's basically a tax. And then they go, they do this math, and they say, okay, you owe us 23 spots, 10000 a spot. Now, I want to say, this is a negotiable number. They just make it up. They're like, well, is this idiot stupid enough to pay this? No, I wasn't. So here's the problem, though. I had to spend probably another $50,000 on doing surveys and hiring uh, lawyers to sort this out. And then we ended up, you know what we ended up paying? $30,000. So they wanted two thirty, and we basically go to meetings at the city, deal with this, pay this lawyer, do that, pay into other forms of infrastructure, also lose six months, and then we pay $30,000 because we don't want to pay the two thirty. That's what's happening in the system. And again, they don't create parking spots, just poof, nothing. They just take the money and light it on fire. System's such a fucking mess. So what do you think about Pierre's solution to all of this. He essentially broke it down into four areas. So he called it his common sense plan, which is one, require big cities to complete 15% more home building per year as a condition of getting federal infrastructure money. Two, give building bonuses to cities that exceed the 15% target. Dollars should be based on housing completions, not promises. Three, require every federally funded transit station be permitted for high-density apartments around it and withhold the federal transit grants until apartments are built and occupied. Number four, sell off 15% of federal buildings in thousands of acres of surplus federal land suitable for housing. I think he's doing about as much as he can for where he's currently at, which I think is important. Now, they're all very feasible ideas. Now, Eventually, you're going to get to a problem, though, when you're talking about growing 15% a year. Like, that's going to hit a mark where you have to revisit that probably after three to four years because you're going to get to this point that it's just too much to meet the threshold. And the critical infrastructure money will be more important as they scale up. So he's going to have to revise that, but I think it's a reasonable plan uh, for the next few years. I really do. Um, In terms of the bonuses, sure, that's great. I think you drive things by incentive and accountability. Always good to see in politics. Great idea. As far as the, the you know, federally funded transit stations being permitted for high density, it's amazing to me that it's not already there. You know, there was a city, I, I'm going to forget the province. It's in Canada. There's a, um, a place where they just got sued for like several million dollars because they would not approve high density next to transit. It was like 2,000 units they wanted to build. So these, these, these developers just sued the city. Because here's the thing. We've gotten to this point where the city and the, 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 the politicians and the, the infrastructure that exists in government, they forget that they work for the people. The idea of government is to try to make our lives better, to add value so that we can scale better, do better for the country, do more for others, be there to help us. You're supposed to be a helping hand, a support tool. Instead, all they do is make our lives harder to justify their own existence. And for me, that's such, it's just such a piss off. Like, I think he's going to have trouble implementing some of them. I think he's going to have a lot of pushback because I think a lot of people are going to realize something. We don't need to be here. We are redundant. And they're going to find this out pretty quick. So what are you going to do? You're going to start kicking and screaming. I think he's going to meet a lot of a lot of pushback. We're 35th out of 36th, I think, in OECD nations in, ter- in terms of um, permit approvals and from raw land to finished product. So it's pretty much the worst in the world. Like we're just, in any developed nation, we're pretty much the fucking worst at this. But... You know, and, and one thing I think I remember is the U.S. and the U.K. are three times faster, but they don't sacrifice quality or safety. So 
there's a lot of red tape in the middle, but that those are people's jobs. So when you do implement these things, I think they're a touch idealistic, even though I think they're the right thing to do. What I mean to say is, how do you implement these? How do you how do you cut through the red tape yourself on the back end so that you can implement these things and make them come true? Or, or maybe even better yet, get them to a point that it is actually efficient building. So that even if you do have it in place, that it works so that there's no corruption. You know, that it works so that it actually works efficiently for Canadians. Anyway, I think he's headed in the right direction. One other thing I would like to see is something to try to bolster the workforce. Um, I don't know what that looks like right now, but I really think it's important because here's the, here's the biggest problem. You've got the infrastructure to provide material. It exists already. You have your Home Depot is low. You have all these things. Maybe one more pops up. I don't know. Supply and demand. But if we're going to double the number of homes we're building, what does that mean from an employment standard? Or uh, from not a standard, but like an employment perspective rather, right? Like you effectively need to double it, but probably even more. And I'll tell you why is the people that are currently working in the system are going to be more efficient than the new second group to come in because they're not going to have the same set of skills. So you may have to increase it by 125% to get this done. What are we doing to accomplish that goal? How are we driving incentive? And I'd like to see something there. Moving on to the next topic here. We've got a overarching talk about immigration going on. So with UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announcing a crackdown on immigration in the recent electoral success of Netherlands Prime Minister Geert Wilders, the once prevailing globalist open borders consensus is showing signs of disintegration. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's vision of a post-national state for Canada is now grappling with the pragmatic response of the public to mass immigration. The resistance against elite-dominated policies signals a potential realignment in the global landscape. Canada, historically aligned with perpetual increases in immigration levels, is facing a shift in public sentiment as indicated by recent polls. A ledger survey reveals that 75% of Canadians believe record immigration targets contribute to housing affordability and the healthcare crisis. So what's your initial thoughts on the public change in sentiment towards immigration? Well, I think that if you look through a lot of other countries, especially in Europe, we're seeing these problems everywhere, right? Um, Austria, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Hungary, Sweden, Poland, now the UK and the Netherlands, they all have, they're all implementing or have implemented more strict immigration rules because it's effectively ruining the country for the people who are there. So this is not a new problem. We're all just becoming a little more aware of it. You're seeing what's happening in Ireland right now, too. I mean, fucking um, Conor McGregor's arguing with the guy. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, this has got to change. This has got to stop. You know, you're, you're just supporting, you know, refugees and people that are coming in and it's, it's ruining the country. You know, but I, I want to say, like, I don't have any problem with immigration. I don't have any problem with multiculturalism. I don't. What I have a problem with is when you scale it faster than critical infrastructure. So faster than hospitals, faster than homes, faster than the economy can manage. Because then what happens is everyone that's already in the country, they start to suffer. And it becomes this disproportionate problem, especially in sort of like Western ideology right now. They want to spend more time and more money on the new refugees that got in rather than taking care of the people that have been here. This is the big problem I think you're seeing all throughout the West. And what I think this is, is the turning of a tide, right? So we've been kind of, you and I have been watching this happen over the last several months, several years. Um, Georgia Milani, I think, from Italy was one of the first big ones. And you're just going to continue seeing it. And again, it to me, this is the shift, not necessarily away from liberals to conservatives, but away from sort of this, you know, this really, really big problem with open borders. It's, it's an ineffective policy. It doesn't work well for the people that are there. And I'm of the mind that everyone's now becoming more aware of it. You know, and it's this weird thing where people are like, oh, you're being xenophobic, this, that, whatever. But when you look at these polls, I mean, the numbers say otherwise. Well, there was a great uh, clip that I watched from Christopher Hitchens. He said, uh, resist it while you still can before the right to complain is taken away from you. You will be told you can't complain because you're Islamophobic. The real conversation isn't whether closed borders or open borders, the rational conversation to have is what is the acceptable level of immigration. And that's what you're talking about with, you know, modeling it along with infrastructure uh, building. But it is crazy to see that you're essentially labeled racist, bigoted, any of these 
terms, inflammatory terms that, are, that everybody yeah. is scared of having hurled their way. If you even question at all the current rate of immigration, and uh, a buddy of mine, Lewis Brackpool, a reporter from the UK, just covered it, and he did a great job. But he was talking about how the current rate in the UK of immigration would require them to build 18 cities the size of Birmingham per year, per year to keep up. <laughs> so, so here's my question. Why? Why do it? Why have this pace of immigration? There's two ways to look at it, economically and then from sort of a political, maybe ideological standpoint. Economically, Canada's driven their GDP since World War II on immigration, right? Um, however, the threshold's always been different. You know, when we had a high threshold, we were bringing in high earners, people that are contributing to society. Now we're doing this thing where six out of 10 can't keep a job over the last couple of years. That was the statistic. That wasn't, that wasn't making it up, you know? The other thing is, you know, when you're not working, they're just costing the government more money, which is costing the people more money. We've been letting in a lot more refugees and asylum seekers, you know, and obviously we've bolstered these numbers to, you know, over, well, if you take in non-permanent residents, over a million a year. Wild number that we can't keep up with. But to some degree, I understand that they do it to drive the economy. So I, I actually, I understand that perspective and see the value in that because prior to the last eight years, it has been an effective enough policy in Canada. You know, like if you looked at our national debt before Trudeau, not bad, not great, not bad. Could have been gone with the right, right politicians, but not bad. You look at how the country and everything was growing, affordability, quality of life, how many hospitals there were, like a lot of well, medical, well, let's, let's say from the medical system. Um, but you, you kind of look at that and you're like, things aren't bad. I understand like driving this many people into the country and it is working for Canadians. I don't think violence was a really big problem. I think we were okay. But when you ramp it up substantially, I, I think it starts going the other way. What happens is now it ends up costing the country more than it is bolstering our GDP. And I think that's where we're at. So that's kind of into the ideological side. This is a bit of a tinfoil hat. You know, you can put the strap on. I was, I, think you say, know, I was just about to be like, yo, let's put the yeah, tinfoil hat on for Because I know you know more about this for <laughs> sure. But there seems to be this overarching idea of bringing in people from all other parts of the world at scale to sort of break down your own culture. And it's, there's, there's, so there's, they're pushing a loss of national identity within each country to work towards maybe globalizing governments, whether it's one or two governments or just, you know, the way I see it is more East and West. Maybe it's a single government. I don't know. But the way that they're doing this and the way that people are supporting the negative things that they're doing, like in Ireland, when that foreign national stabbed those kids and the government comes out and supports them and says everyone else that they're being, they're being racist and xenophobic. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense unless you're trying to break, break down a cultural barrier for a particular reason. So there are a number of instances that sort of support that theory, but I would actually like to hear you expand a little more on that. Going back to this Agenda 2030, the World Economic Forum and the UN sustainable goals, essentially, of uh, a diverse and equitable society for all. Looking at that, I go, I think it is very possibly a play to just create chaos that they can then come in and say oh we just need a little bit more authority and control and we can we can put this we can put everything back into place and i think even if if things got bad enough with the chaos in these nations i think you'd even see libertarian minded people start to maybe give up a little bit of those liberties in order to have some safety order restored right going to that point about breaking down the culture of our society so you look at what are what are western values which is it's the idea that society exists for the sake of the individual that the individual doesn't exist for the sake of society that's where we're taking this turn because you see a lot of these, whether it be immigration, whether it be climate change, any of these big issues that are all under this Agenda 2030 umbrella, they all require us to take on that idea of you need to make individual sacrifices for the greater good right. for, for society. Right. But our Western values literally undermine that very concept. And this is why you're seeing people that throughout COVID, all this kind of stuff where it's going, I don't care if it uh, helps the spread, you do not get to take away my my liberties. Right. And I think these are a way to undermine all of that. There's the idea that there's nothing wrong with multiculturalism, but I think there's nothing wrong with multiculturalism as long as those cultures have a mutual agreement 
on certain values. I agree with that. So as soon as you start bringing in cultures en masse that say don't believe in things like women's rights or sure. they don't value life the rights, same way too. all of this yeah. kind of stuff those cultures cannot coexist not peacefully and there's a great uh quote from douglas murray where he says uh those who believe that europe is for the world have never explained why this process should be one way why Europeans going anywhere else in the world is colonialism, whereas the rest of the world coming to Europe is just fair and fine. It does seem like there is an objective to this. Yeah. What is essentially becoming a political nightmare for even the people that are putting them into place. You don't see them at all sit back and go, oh, yeah, you know what? We had an objective and we haven't hit it, so we need to... Uh, readdress how we're, how we're different focusing levers. on this. Yeah, yeah. You see them double down, and they go, "Nope, we need more of this. It's it's working. We, we love multicultural. Right. All of this stuff." So there's n absolutely no readdressing this situation, which makes me wonder: maybe they're getting what they wanted out of this policy. That makes sense. I mean, you made a really good point there in terms of them using this to drive a wedge between society to cause more trouble so that they could implement themselves to fix the problem again. Basically, the, the standard government thing, create the problem, here's the solution. So I actually really agree with that. I think that's a good point. Um, but one thing I kind of wanted to highlight when you said that is when everybody is losing their individual freedoms and it's going more towards the group, well, what is that? It's fucking communism. And that's why when I say these things and people are like, you sound like you're crazy, you're wearing a tinfoil hat, we're not a communist country. Not yet, but the more they take away individual freedoms so that you can do what's right for the group, that's where we're going. And I, I, I see that like, that's a really good point. I didn't think about that, but I feel like that bridge is sort of my thought a lot better in understanding why they're doing these things. Because if you drive that wedge and you create this thing where you're creating more problems and then they have more power, they're going to be able to implement more of these things. Like, hey, you need to give up a little more for the group so that we can keep you safe. Perhaps that's maybe the deeper reason why we're seeing everything shift the other way because people are going, we're losing too many individual freedoms and that's why all those countries in Europe and you're seeing the states is really, the states is going to be Republican again. I don't care what people say, it's what's going to happen. And a lot of it's going to be border issues. You hear what, what Trump has been saying these days. Unfortunately, I think Canada will continue with its open border policy as long as Trudeau's in power. Uh, but I think once Pierre gets in, he is definitely pro-immigration, but I think he'll dial that number down to a couple hundred thousand so we can try to get a hold of things. Do you think that Given the strategy they have in sort of the Western world through this liberal ideology and what they're pushing towards, do you think that there's an effective engine in place or effective system in place to stop them and to reverse course? Or do you feel like we've already gone so far that we're now going to have to put the pieces together afterwards and fight that system once it's there? I think you could probably just start slowing it by bringing the rates down to manageable levels of immigration the most interesting part about it is always public perception is how popular is are those ideas going to be because as we both know it's not the most efficient or effective policies that get put in place it's the ones that the think you're going to get you points at the next right. voting yeah. voting cycle it's either that it's the ones they want or the ones that they need to control the system it's one or the other we are seeing the public sentiment shift on this yes definitely but unless we see it in kind of a more it even shift further yeah i think it's got to be an action taking stage yeah i think i think it needs to get to the point where people start demanding action and to your point about the whole the the communist um label yeah people throw a heyday when you when you start saying stuff like what we're seeing is communism i try to boil it down to it doesn't matter whether it's communism or fascism sure. or any of this kind of stuff it's tyrannical collectivism at the end of the day how how what mask that tyrannical collectivism wears doesn't matter right. nearly as much as just the fact that individual liberties are being infringed upon but this is something you know to put the communist mask back on it for a second this is something that trotsky the original one of the original and most prominent thinkers of the bolsheviks who carried out the russian revolution and instilled communism and this is a very common Marxist theory as well, that no communist revolution can be successful unless it envelops the whole world. 
Otherwise, you're merely a communist country living in a capitalist world. Right. You have to, this was the critique that got labeled, put against the Soviet Union a lot, which was that it was engaging in free trade. How, right. how are you communist, but you're, you're limiting free trade for your civilians, but then right. from a national perspective, you have to go out and engage with other, other, uh, yeah. other nations. Yeah. And then so you see that, yeah, th this idea where it's like, okay, maybe this is just uh, another route for some of those Marxist intellectuals. I mean, you look at guys like Klaus Schwab. I, I mean, I saw a statue of uh, Lenin in, sitting in his office one day. So you go, all right, this guy's obviously right there with the most Marxist of all Marxist intellectuals and ideologues. And so I do see that where I go, okay, maybe this is another, another route to the, uh, the, the global communist agenda. I want to highlight that one thing you said because I think it will give people a lot of hope. Um, if you don't have communism globally, you can't have successful communism. The reason I like that so much is because I think it helps people realize that even if we go a really long way down the wrong path, there's no way in our lifetime the world's going to collectively jump in on this. It's not going to happen. We're too divided in how we operate our religions, our cultures, our beliefs, our values. It's not going to happen. And the United States will blow itself up before it gets there, which is fine. Like, I don't want to see that happen, but I like that we have them kind of in our, our backyard in a sense because they will, put, they will fight this tooth and nail. So as long as we're around, we're never going to see a successful... We're never going to see a successful form of communism. It's not going to happen. Maybe some modified form. Maybe things continue down this path where, like you said, we continue to lose more individual freedoms, regardless of what labels put on it. That's kind of the way it seems to be going. But it's nice when you say that, like, hey, if there's not a full buy-in, which there's no way there will be, we're all going to find a way through this, which I think is really important. One of the things I wanted to finish off with um, for this section was just talking about this one ledger poll, because you were saying that Canadians are sort of having a change of sentiment. And there's some numbers that popped up in a recent poll, and... Um, according to this ledger poll, 56% of Canadians said that diversity can be a problem. So they're not just, hey, it's great. They're like, this is, it can be an issue. 55% now encourage some form of assimilation and to drop incompatible views. So don't bring your nonsense here. You have to see things the same way as us to some degree, at least, at least so much. Um, On fundamental issues. Exactly. So that we can coexist peacefully. 75% support deporting criminals and those expressing hatred, especially towards minorities. I would take out the word minority and just say any at all. Like if you're if you're an immigrant here and you're expressing hatred or any of the type of stuff that legally, like would fall under some sort of legal umbrella as hatred or terrorism or anything like that, yeah, let people know they can be deported. Don't support that kind of stuff here. 75% feel that way. And the other one, which I thought was a big one, is that 50% reject granting more rights for decolonization, racism, or equity. Sorry, re re read that one. 50% of the country reject granting more rights for decolonization, racism, or equity. So they've had enough of giving people in marginalized groups an extra leg up. That's even that's even scary. We need that higher that number way higher. Oh, we do, but it's good that it's good that people are seeing what well, you, you know why like I thought that number would be 25%, not 50. You know, I think what happens is people sort of recognize that there have been systems put in place that have made it harder for certain races or groups. Or they're, they're, This is a real thing. Like, an easy one to point out is just the fact that the Indigenous people don't have clean drinking water. They don't. Like, th this is a... We spend so much money every year on government bullshit and we can't fix that problem. So I actually think stuff like that, like, not necessarily granting more rights, but I can understand the perspective of saying granting more rights when you look at how some of them are currently being treated. I think... I would like to see everybody get treated the same. I'm of the I'm of the mind that I believe in sort of an equality across the board. That's how I operate. But I thought that was interesting that you're seeing this shift away from this victimology mindset in society going, no, like you're here, at least half of them anyway, you're here and you should be treated the same as everyone else. Obviously that, that number needs to grow, but I actually, I thought it was better than I had expected. And one of the statistics there that you're talking about where people can are starting to see where diversity can be a problem. There's a great Thomas Sowell quote where he says, the next time some academics tell you how important diversity is, ask how many conservatives there are in their sociology department. Yeah. <laughs> and even that number, you know, saying it's only 50%, it needs to be a lot higher. The reason I say that is because they call it decolonization, right? They say, they say that word. Yes. Well, look at what the October 7th attack in Israel was labeled as. This is the process of decolonization. Right. This is so. I see a lot of these buzzwords that get tossed around as really 
Trojan horses for literal oppression. It's it's a, it's a it's a flip of the script. I have a theory that these people that say want to decolonize the West, they have less interest in taking apart government power and more interest in just wielding it. Well, th this actually goes to another theory that I have about sort of the way of the world these days. We are really good at pointing out what the problem is these days. We Everything's a fucking problem, but we're really good at highlighting what the problem is. However, we don't fix the problem well. So what we do is if you have something that's happened on one side, instead of correcting that and going to the middle, what we do is we do something equally terrible on the other side to balance the scales. That is the solution. That is the way of the world these days. So that's just a problem with, it might be human nature. It might be political. I don't really know. I can't, I can't quite put my finger on it. But that I think is sort of why you see a lot of this stuff is they go, well, this is the way it was for so long. Even though you people like you and I, we are not actually a part of that problem. We've never done anything. I mean, I can speak for myself. I think same for you. I'm not mean to anybody. I'm not terrible to anybody. I don't consider anybody better or worse than anybody. I do see the world very equally. That's how I operate. However, you're looking at all these problems that happened in the past, and then people from today, from these marginalized communities, they want to balance the scale on those problems. So like you said, rather than fixing it and finding balance, which I think we pretty much have in a big way, if you really look at it, I think most people are given equal opportunity in the country for the most part. I know it's not perfect, but from where we were to where we are, I think the biggest difference you see now is in um, economic classes more than anything else. But see, the, the thing is, is that equality of opportunity will never equal equality of outcome. Of course not, because everyone's going to work harder and has different strengths. Exactly. But then people use inequalities of outcome as evidence of inequality of right. opportunity and yeah and those things and and that's that i think is the biggest narrative and that's one that i try to shift a lot because there is cultural reasons for these so for instance people will point out america is a good example of how america is a white supremacist nation that and all of its institutions have been set up to serve white people well they'll point to things like white Americans have double the household income than black Americans. But then they'll completely leave out the fact that Indian Americans have double the household income of white Americans. So you actually look at those those numbers and white Americans are in the middle of the pact yep. as, as far as that. But even the statistics themselves are insanely flawed because... They're all household statistics. They're not individual statistics. So as soon as you look at that, you go, okay, well, some cultures have more in their household. Of course. Then yeah. you're like, okay, so there's more earners under this roof. Of course, they're going to have- It's going to be disproportionate. They're Absolutely. going to be disproportionate. And then, you know, this isn't going to be popular to say, but when you look at the fact that 70, high 70% 70 of black children don't have a biological father in the house, who is typically the highest earner- Yeah then of course that household income, if they're the highest earner short yes. in the household, of course, of course it's going to it's manifest be disproportionate, that way. But you don't look at the actual, you don't look at the fundamentals that make up the, the figures you're using. Yeah. Exactly. So you can, you can explain away a lot of these issues through culture. What you don't see is people taking that same approach to say, Jewish communities, when it's, okay, why why the high success rate in there? Well, their culture also explains why they're so does. successful Absolutely. there. They, take it there. they look out for their own more than any other culture in the world. That's why they have success as a group. Circling back into this equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome conversation, until that narrative changes, until we as a society accept that there is going to be differences, whether it be across racial lines, whether it be across gender lines and all of this kind of stuff, I truly believe that that is the crux of this issue. Because if we continue to believe that any inequalities is uh, proof of oppression or racism or sexism or any of these things, then there is no solving the answer because we're not even having the right conversations. No, I agree. I think to wrap it up, I would suggest that the people who are trying to gain power and wield more government power, like you said, they know that they're utilizing flawed statistics and a flawed solution so that they can continue doing these things. It's the unwinnable war. 
but you motivate people to fight it and you can keep getting what you want out of it. I think it's just another example of that exact thing. All right. So speaking of getting what you want out of war, a pair of American law professors are alleging that some stock traders had advanced knowledge of the Hamas attacks in Israel on October 7th and used that information to make millions of dollars by short selling Israeli stocks. Short selling is a strategy where investors bet that a stock's price will fall. They borrow shares of the company and sell them, hoping to buy them back later at a lower price and make a profit. The professors say that the spike in short selling suggests that some traders were aware of the impending attack and used that information to make money. What's your thoughts? Ugh, I mean, I actually have a, an interesting sort of take on Wall Street as a guy that like believes in capitalism. You know, like these guys have been in one way or another, they're part of every big problem we have because the world is driven by money, right? So whether you're looking at the 08 financial crisis, their role in that, um, you know, predatory lending, which is just sort of further suppresses poor and marginalized communities. It's what it does. Um, obvious market manipulation to suit their needs. And, you know, I think they, like I said, they, they always wear some blame in terms of their role, say, in like the opioid crisis or exploiting developing countries to suit their needs. Like, you know, and this sort of brings me to my 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 thought. As a guy that believes in capitalism, I actually think that the stock market in a lot of ways, in the United States specifically, um, because they're driven by shareholder primacy, uh, which means they focus on the fiduciary duty for the for the investor, not for social responsibility. I think in a lot of the ways they are what drive corporations to be evil. And I know that sounds hokey, like, oh, evil corporations, greed. But it's actually not because when you are driven by, if you have a fiduciary duty to drive profits for your investors, then you will do whatever you need to to make sure that company makes more money, right? So if you're being publicly traded and you live in this sort of shareholder primacy world, then eventually all big corporations that are a part of this system are going to become evil. They're going to do the wrong things. Sure, there are some companies like, I don't know, there's maybe some athletics companies that don't really participate in this. But at scale, the companies that make this kind of money, they eventually all sort of have to have to go the, the wrong way. They have to turn bad. You know what I mean? Well, we were talking about that in regards to Elon the other day and kind of cutting him some slack saying that when you're operating at a certain level you have to you know to to stay in the game on that level and remain clean is just impossible i agree so i think it comes down to a what level what's the what's the ratio of say productive give back compared to parasitical nature of these corporations but i also look at it and go okay if corporations are immoral just like we see government as or whatever, then why should we put them in charge of giving back to society or any of these kind of things? Like, cause I look at it going like, it's trying to ask for a moral good out of something that's inherently immoral. Right, in you're sense. trying to almost like balance the scales in a sense. It's kind of like you can do all these terrible things if you do these nice things, which I don't really see life that way. I think you should just kind of always do the right thing. But I think this is a big reason. I think the stock market, um, the U.S. specifically is a big reason why you see sort of that evil side of things. I think that's why a lot of those things exist, like the stuff we were talking about Elon the other day, why we have to cut these companies some slack. I think a lot of it is a product of systems like this, but it's purely driven by the economics behind things. But I mean, it's unfortunate. You know, when I was younger, I think I was about 24. And I was like, I don't want to live life this way. I would like to do, I would like to play a different game. I would like to do, I would like to go against the mold, blah, 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 whatever every idealistic kid says who thinks he's going to change the world. Um, but then at that point in time, I came to realize, I'm like, fuck, we're playing a game of Monopoly. That's what this is. The sooner you can realize that and start figuring out the rules and maybe how to circumvent a few in the right way and get ahead, that's what you need to do because you don't get to change the game. You're already in the middle of it. And there's no way for you to stop that. It's just not going to happen. And I think this is sort of one of the darker sides of that game of Monopoly. And I think this is no different. I mean... For me, this one just crosses some very dark lines. People are literally profiting off of off of terror, off death. Well, but let me let me ask you then. So, do you assume that it's American businessmen, or you've got to assume as well that these some of these international oligarchies and rulers have an understanding of some potential developments? So, 
know, we know that Hamas leadership sure. is worth billions Very upon wealthy. billions upon billions. Yep. You look at, say, who they're rubbing shoulders with in that world, whether it be uh, things like Iran and the Ayatollah. Maybe they're the ones profiting off of this in Wall Street. Maybe it's not Wall Street guys that we know and think of, yeah. but it's international actors. So I actually, when I say Wall Street, I don't actually mean the individuals on Wall Street. What I mean is the stock market. Okay. So I should clarify. I use that as sort of a blanket term. Um because the system exists so they can they can benefit off of it, whether they're, you know, Hamas or Palestinian or the Ayatollah. Like, it, it doesn't really matter. Like, for me, that's actually what exactly what I think happened because it'd be too dangerous to let this outside of that, that close circle. But I think it would be interesting to sort of track who was doing it and why. And I'm not sure that they've got that kind of clarity. I'm not sure if they can. I'm not... Here's the thing. If you're going to invest that kind of money and you know what you're doing, you're laying, layering this through multiple corporations in different countries. There's no way you're tracking this because I know several countries that have non-disclosure for their corporations. So even if I'm, I'm a dummy and I'm, I know how to do this so that you'd never know it was me. You know what I mean? So I, I know that these guys can do that. I guess my problem is, you know, it, it's, 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 it shows you it's, it's a symptom of a, of a system that allows for this kind of evil. That's the thing is they, we basically have an economic system that you can go kill a bunch of people and then you can actually make a ton of money off of it by investing in the New York Stock Exchange. That to me is a fundamental problem. That that kind of and that's why I kind of highlighted some of the other issues that these you know sort of Wall Street is a part of. You know, um, and again, this this one for me is a little tough to swallow, and I'll tell you why. You can invest in in military companies, weapons companies. You can invest in a lot of these things that make 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 weapons or make machinery to kill people. That's what it does. They also defend countries and blah, blah. You can skin it any way you want, right? But when you invest in these, you're like, okay, there's a conflict in the Middle East or there's a conflict in Ukraine. This is going to go up in price. Oh, the U.S. just did this with, you know, granting another $100 billion to this company. This is going to go up. So you kind of hedge your bets understanding what's going on globally. But this one, this one's bad because you objectively decided to sacrifice human lives to make money. Mm -hmm. That's what you did, effectively. You know what was going to happen, and instead of raising a red flag or pointing it out or saying, hey, maybe we could stop this. Again, like you said, it's probably more the bad guys than the good guys in that sense, you know? Um, it's a loose term, but you know what I mean. So maybe that was never on their agenda to stop it anyway. But it's hard for me to swallow because, I don't know, man, I guess it's hard because you're seeing people profit millions of dollars off of killing other humans, and you're basically paying yourself to be a hitman. And that system we know now exists by shorting stocks like they did. Oh yeah, well that that system has has existed for time. I mean, it's even the plot of Casino Royale. Right. You know, you think about it at the beginning. It's Le Le Chiff or whatever the villain's name is in that movie. He takes a bunch of money from different warlords, promising them a crazy return on investment. Yeah. Then you know he shorts a airline and then tries to carry out a terrorist attack against that airline yep. in order to profit off of shorting their stocks. Of course. And then obviously Bond stopped it and they lost all their money, but we don't have a real life Bond. But uh, No, but that kind of, to, to your point, we're talking about Bond villains. Yeah. These are the kind of slimy scum fucks that do this stuff. And I guess it's, it's, it's a little depressing that these systems exist, but I guess it is what it is. Like I said, you're playing Game Monopoly. I'm not sure there's anything you can do to change it. You can maybe try to incentivize things or you can try to build algorithms to pick up on stuff like this to say, okay, if something like this is happening, if, if someone's, if like, like the numbers were interesting. This was in like the 99th percentile in terms of like volume of how much this stock has been shorted over the last like 15 years. So it was definitely what this was. And they did it again in April when there was supposed to be a Hamas attack. So this is a coordinated group that knows what they're doing. It's not a fluke. This is definitely happening on purpose. They're, they're, so I don't know if they're going to keep digging. I know the SEC says, oh, we don't tell you if we're digging or wh whatever they're up to. But because of the way the system works, I don't even know if there's a way to stop it. And I think that's what's maybe a little depressing for the general public, you know? Not to overquote the man, but... There's another one by Sol where he says, there's no such thing as solutions, only trade-offs. And these are the trade-offs that I see with capitalism. Because like yourself, I am a big fan of capitalism. I think it's the best economic system hum humans have ever created. Maybe there's a better one, but it definitely has not been tried yet. And I'm not a fan of when people that are like-minded to us 
try to pretend and say, well, this isn't this isn't real capitalism because in real capitalism, the free market wouldn't allow this kind of thing or monopolies or whatever whatever it be the downfalls of capitalism they they do the exact same thing that marxists do which is well that was never real communism that was corrupted communism right. that was that was if if we had it it would be different if we were in charge things would be different and i think this is one of those conversations that lends itself to being like, we have to be realistic that there is always going to be downsides to every system that we put into place. I agree. It makes you sound a little bit heartless, but you go, okay, maybe these are the trade-offs. Right. We need to accept these as as something that will inherently happen under a, in a capitalist society, and maybe there just is no way to change that. Okay, well, can you have capitalism without the stock market? Theoretically, you could. Right, because you did for a long time, right? So that's kind of like my, I realize you can't fix this, and I know there's no silver bullet, but and I know there's still going to be bad happening, but I wonder if there would be a way to extrapolate the evil that comes from the existence of a stock market versus all other part, parts or portions of capitalism. Because I would be willing to bet at least half of all evil that happens in the entire system of capitalism happens through the stock market. That's what yeah. I think. And... Honestly, it's a way for it, it primarily it's a way for the very wealthy to get far more wealthy. For sure. And the way within the people within I say Wall Street to, you know, get super, super wealthy and manipulate systems and do all these things that are wrong. Look, no one manipulates the stock market for good. Doesn't happen. So I know we can't get rid of the system, but I do believe that we would be better off if we never had it. Again, I know it's impractical. It's not my intention to say, oh, let's get rid of the stock market. It's too far gone. That's a game. That's a, that's a part of Monopoly that's already there. There's already a hotel on Park Place, dude. Shut the fuck up. I get it. But I think that would be to your point about saying, you know, you get these people that saying, well, that's not, that's corrupted, uh, you know, communism or corrupted Marxism or whatever. This is a corrupted side of capitalism, but I think capitalism could exist very well without it. That's kind of my point. I agree. Well, no, that seems like a good spot to... Uh to leave it off anything else you wanted to add no that's everything thanks everybody uh if you enjoyed the podcast you could like or subscribe that'd be wonderful and if you really love what we're doing you could join us at blendernews.com and you could sign up for the newsletter uh otherwise that's everything thanks bye everybody